Okay, so uh, we will start. So he hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. So my name is Valérie Vignan, and I'm working at the uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, close to Paris in the Laboratoire des Solides Irradiés. And the topic of today is, well, that's the first talk of the nonlinear session. So it will be related to nonlinear uh, non optical spectroscopies. Okay. This is the, the outline. First, I will show you what, uh, what kind of process we are looking at, uh, some examples of uh, nonlinear spectroscopies. And in the second part, I will show you how we can calculate in an ab initio way uh, some nonlinear response. And this will be, see if it works. yeah, so second order response and uh, the EFISH, uh, which is a third order response. Uh, so some examples. So the, the idea is to know the response of a material, it can be a solid, it could be atoms or molecules, to an external perturbation. In our case, uh, the external perturbation is an electric field because it's the response to some electromagnetic radiation because we are doing optics. And so we have an incoming external electric field, which uh, interact with the material, and we are looking at the response. Mm. Uh, the, the quantity that is interesting for us is the polarization of the medium. The elect external field inside the material will create the polarization, which depends on the frequency of the field, of the intensity of the field. And this uh, polarization can be uh, in the framework of low, well, not too high, say not too high intensities uh, can can be uh, expanded in a series in terms of the electric field so we have several terms the first one is just proportional to the external field we have a second one which is proportional to the square so that's the second order response then we have the third order response and so on uh, the, the idea of this nonlinear stuff is the fact that we can create new frequencies. And you can see this. Uh, so the external field is an, uh, an oscillating function of time so that is described here as a cosine. The frequency of the uh, external field is omega. And if you plug this quantity into the polarization and linearize all the, the, the the oscillating function, what you get at the end is a, a term that does not depend on time, which is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the electric field. Then a term that is proportional to the cosine of uh, omega t. So omega t is the incoming, the omega is the incoming frequency. Then a term that depends of twice the incoming frequency and three times and so on. So the, the nonlinearity of the medium will create new frequencies because you, you have omega at the beginning, two omega, three omega, and so on at the end. So that's basically the idea of the nonlinear uh, spectroscopy. In terms of uh, the external field, well, the first term is just proportional, the, 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 this term is just proportional to the external field. And when we add all the, the, the other terms, it's we are changing the dependence on uh, the external on the external field. So we we can include only the quadratic terms, so the second order response, the cubic one, and they they all have uh, a different different behavior in terms of the amplitude of the field, which will change the the, the, the response. So the the first one linear. Uh, linear optics so proportional to the external field. The, the coefficient, which is just in front, is called the susceptibility. So we have the first order susceptibility, second order. And so this one has no change in the frequency. And all the others are considered as nonlinear optics. So that's starting at second order, and you can go as high as you, you want. Uh, so. Nonlinear optical spectroscopy was discovered, well, not discovered, but the, the, the experimental study of nonlinear spectroscopy started in the in, in, in 1960 uh, with the discovery of the laser. In fact, it's it's 
quite obvious that if you go to, to higher terms, you need higher intensities. Otherwise, they are just uh, too small to be detected compared to the, the, the linear terms. So with the laser, we can have enough intensity to uh, so that all the higher order terms come into play in the polarization. So that's uh, all these terms that can be uh, detected. Uh, so, just a, 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 a short word about laser. So, laser, which means light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. There, there are several properties that are very important for us. So, the, well, the high intensity, that's obvious. But the spatial coherence and the temporal coherence are, are very uh, important because that's the way we can get intense, highly collimated monochromatic beam. And that's what we are looking for with the nonlinear optics. So the for, for the, the, the collimated beam, if you just take a, an ordinary source, just the lamp, I mean you, you get light in whole space. It, the, the emission is more or less isotropic. The, the fact that we have a laser will allow us to, to have very tiny uh, collimated beam that propagates for uh, on a long distance without defocusing, and uh, the, the, we can also collimate the beam on a very tiny spot, which gives access also to spatially resolved uh, spectroscopy. So that's one point. Then monochromaticity. So this is again uh, some examples of light that do not come from laser, so just normal lamp. And this is the intensity as a function of the uh, the frequency of the emitted light. So you see that we have a huge band of frequencies that are emitted. Uh, it can be a little bit better if we have some tube, neon tube, for instance. So you see that the, the, the range is a bit more narrow in that case. For a laser, that's what we get. So just one frequency which is emitted. So we have different laser. We have uh, blue light, red light, but it, it's in principle always monochromatic. This is a bit theoretical because in fact, we have the first uncertainty relation of Heisenberg, which couples the uh, duration of emission to the, 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 the wavelengths that the delta wavelengths that are emitted. And the shorter the emission is, the broader the, the, the range of wavelengths you get. And for instance, this is the theoretical spectrum of the laser, so a kind of delta peak. And depending on uh, the duration of emission, so the, the, it can be in the picosecond range, it can be in the femtosecond range, then you will get a, a broad spectrum. If you go to attosecond uh, pulses, you get something which is becoming very large. So that's what you get, in fact, in real life. You have a, a quite important range. It's not completely monochromatic. So, the first nonlinear process, that's second harmonic generation. First of all, it's the, the first of the nonlinear case, the first one which does not fall into the linear optics. And uh, it does not require a too high intensity. So, it was discovered uh, in uh, 1961 by Franken and collaborators. And this is a, a schematic view of the experiment. Uh, just to, to, to explain how it, it worked at that time. In fact, they did not notice at the beginning that they, they got second harmonic generation. It was such a tiny spot that, that they thought it was just uh, something wrong in the, in, the, in the experiment. They did not notice that it was, it was really part of the spectrum. It's just after uh, seeing that the, the position of this strange spot was corresponding just at the second harmonic that they realized that they got it in the, 
the, se the second harmonic was discovered for the for the first time. And so that's how the spectrum looks like. So here you have the incoming frequency, and here you have the second harmonic. So you see that uh, if you look at the spots of the incoming frequency, you need really good glasses to see the second harmonic point. You really have to think it. <laughs> The EDF, uh, for me is white today. It's just white, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a small... Because you don't have the good glasses. <laughs> <laughs> you could think that it's a piece of dust. On the... <laughs> no, finally, it was second second harmonic generation. Yeah. Can I just quick... Um, quartz is uh, centrosomatic? Uh, oh. Depends on on the you, you have several prototype of parts. Yes. Okay. The normal one, yeah, is is uh, so, some some crystallographic are central symmetry, but not all of them. Okay. So not this one. Mm -hmm. Obviously not this one. <laughs> so what is second harmonic? Uh, so you have a nonlinear medium an incoming frequency. And if you look at the output, of course, you have the incoming frequency that is transmitted into the, through the medium and uh, sec the, the second harmonic. So the second harmonic corresponds to a process in which two incoming photons are absorbed by the material and one photon is emitted. And due to uh, energy conservation, the uh, the, the, the energy of the emitted photon is twice the energy of the incoming photon. Now, in terms of amplitude, if we look at the expansion in terms of uh, the electric field, because the intensity is not too high, so all the terms in the expansion are uh, decreasing, and we have the linear term, which is much larger than the second one, so second harmonic generation or second order response, which is also much larger than the third order response, and it goes like this. But we, we, we have to take into account the symmetry of the material and uh, the, the chi 2 in the dipole approximation, so in the range of uh, uh, long, wave, long wavelength, uh, the chi 2 is equal to zero for central symmetric materials. Uh, and in fact, it is also true for all even terms, chi-4, chi-6 are always zero for central symmetric uh, material. So in that case, you go directly from the linear term to the third order response, the chi-2 disappears. Uh, second harmonic generation is not the only process that you can get in the second order response. It's the one you get when you have two, the, the, only one incoming field, so only one frequency which comes into play. But if you, you can imagine that you, you, you have two uh, incoming field with two different frequencies. So one is omega one and one is omega two. And the second order polarization will contain all this mm -hmm. So second harmonic of omega one, <clears throat> second harmonic of omega two. So the, the first one depends on the square of, the, of E1, the amplitude of the first field. This one will be proportional to the square of E2. And then you have cross terms. You can have some frequencies generation. So in the process, one photon is absorbed at omega one, one photon is absorbed at omega two or the other way, of course, it's symmetric. And the photon that is emitted is omega-1 plus omega-2. Uh, and the same uh, for the difference between, because you, you have plus omega and minus omega. Just imagine that you represent your uh, electric field as a cosine. The cosine is a sum of two terms, uh, the frequency plus omega and the frequency minus omega, which allows uh, the, the, the fact that we can have omega-1 minus omega-2. And this is difference frequency generation, which is uh, widely used because it's a way to get 
uh, some uh, microwave, uh, so, so very low energy in a range where we cannot have lasers because lasers are not available for all frequencies. Okay, so that's uh, typically what we have. Uh, in the case of the linear response, we have one peak at, if we look at the, the field in terms of the frequency, we have one peak at omega one, one peak at omega two. But for at second order, we have a peak at two omega one, two omega two, one in between, which is the sum of omega one and omega two, and one at small frequency, low frequency, which is omega one minus omega two. <laughs> Uh, there, there is also another case where we get uh, a static field because we can have, if you have only one field, you have omega minus omega, and it's a way to get a static uh, response because from an oscillating field, you get something that does not depend on time anymore because the frequency is zero. So that's called optical rectification, but I will not go further on that. Uh, so that's the, 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 the graphic for all this, uh, this process. So some frequency generation is very close to what you have shown, seen, seen already with the second harmonic generation. And here it's a small frequency that is emitted. If you have questions, yeah. <laughs> what, what is the prevalence of each of these, um, of these some frequency generations or um, second harmonics? Because they all happen at the same time? Yes. But some might be more probable than others. Um, Does it depend on the material? Well, it, it will depend on the material, of course, because the, the coefficient that you have, the guy, the guy two, mm -hmm. uh, is a, it, it depends strongly on the material. Mm -hmm. So it depends also on the frequency that you plug. I will show you later the what would the the, the, the guy two what it looks like. But it depends on the material. It depends on the on the frequency on the incoming frequency and also on the outgoing frequency. Mm -hmm. So even with two different fields, omega-1 and omega-2, uh, the response will uh, depend on what you're looking at. Are you looking at omega-1 plus omega-2, mm -hmm. omega-1 minus omega-2 that enters in, into the response? Uh, so this, this depends. Uh, you, in principle, you do, the, you do not get uh, borders of magnitude between these except if you have a resonant process. Because I, I will show you later, but in, in the expression of the chi 2 you, you have denominators that contains the, diff the difference between two uh, uh, eigen energy of the, of the material minus a frequency. If the frequency match one difference between these uh, materials in the eigenstates, the process is becoming resonant, so very hard. And of course, depending on the fact that you have omega-1 plus omega-2 or omega-1 minus omega-2, it can be resonant or non-resonant. And then you can have a big enhancement or decrease of the response. So that it's, it, I would say that it's mainly the fact that it is resonant or not that will cause the, the highest difference between the processes. Mm. Yes. But what I, I will show you in, I will show you a guide to a real guide to what it looks like. Okay. Um, okay, so there is another second order nonlinearities, uh, which is nonlinearity with a static field. So it's a nonlinear process because it depends on two fields. But this one was discovered much before uh, second harmonic generation. So it's called electro-optic effect. Uh, it's the fact that uh, um, an optical property can be modified if a static field uh, is around the material. And it was, this is uh, what, uh, uh, so it, it's yeah. uh, so you you have an incoming light as before, and the uh, the electric field that modifies the property, and 
this, in fact, can be also described as a second order response because a static field can be considered as a field at frequency uh, zero. And so it's a photon with a frequency and energy that is equal to zero. And so if you, if you want to describe this process, you have a chi 2 that is the frequency of the incoming field, zero, and the outgoing frequency is the same as the uh, incoming one. So that's a second order process that does not modify the frequency of the emitted light, but can strongly modify uh, the intensity of the response. Uh, so why are we so interested in the second harmonic generation? Uh, the first reason is the fact that it can be used as a probe uh, for materials. I told you that uh, second harmonic generation is only non-zero if the material is non-central symmetric. So it means that in fact second harmonic generation or chi 2 processes uh, are strongly sensitive to all the symmetries of the material. So if you have defects, if you have a surface, uh, you can have different type of response. And also it will give access to other states that you cannot probe with the, the, the linear optics because you absorb two photon. And so you get higher in energy and you also have access to different angular momentum because absorbing a photon will change the angular momentum of a state. And so you have access to other states uh, that are not that you cannot see with just linear optics. So it is uh, widely used for the analysis of surfaces because a surface is the strongest breaking of symmetry. I mean, you have a surface below, you have the material above, you have the vacuum. So whatever the material, you have a response at the surface, even if the material is central symmetric. It's just the the fact that you have a surface that uh, breaks the symmetry. Uh, in the same way, thin films, because in that case, uh, you have two uh, surfaces, you break the symmetry, interfaces, nanowires uh, have been studied with the uh, set, the structure of these nano, of nanowires have been uh, studied with high on the second harmonic generation. Uh, so that's just schematic view. So uh, chirality in molecules uh, can be studied, surface reconstruction, <laughs> because at the surface, it's quite difficult to know how the atoms are, are organized at the surface. So a second harmonic is, is used for that. And also in biology, collagen has been uh, studied using uh, second harmonic uh, spectroscopies. Then uh, a second application is the, develop the development of uh, and the characterization of new materials. Uh, to get new uh, optical devices. For instance, if you, if you want to build a laser, you need nonlinear medium. Uh, and uh, there is a, an important search for efficient uh, nonlinear medium and uh, also for second harmonic generation because they have to be efficient. For instance, if you, if you have a pointer, a green pointer, Usually, it's based on second harmonic generation from the red light, because if you multiply the frequency of the red light, you get a green light, and there is no laser in the, in the green red white. It's, it's, it's coming. <laughs> and it is also used, uh, as I told you before, in the microwave regime, where you cannot, because lasers are, are built on um, atomic transition between uh, states. So what you get is what nature gives you with atoms. You cannot have all the, 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 the emission. And it's difficult to have uh, em uh, emission in the microwave regime. So this is based on uh, some uh, on frequency different um, process where you, you, you just subtract two frequencies and you get something which is very low. So, and you, we have to search for this new uh, material that are efficient because of course a second order process has a low probability to occur. So it, we need efficient stuff. Uh, there is also a possibility to use second harmonic generation. 
it would be very interesting to, to design some silicone photonics. Uh, the, the, the problem is that silicone is a central uh, symmetric material. So if you want to, to use silicone, you have to go to third of the process. So you need high intensity and the, the effect would be to just destroy the material because if you use a too high intensity on, you know, on a solid, you just make holes in the, in the solid, so it's not there. So the idea is, could we have in some way a second harmonic with silicone that would be very uh, important for a uh, photonic industry? And one uh, possibility is to break I, uh, by hand, the, the, the central symmetry of silicone by applying some uh, strain on the material. Silicone becomes non-central symmetric, in that case, depending, of course, on the way we apply the, the, the strain. And it becomes uh, an emitter for, for second harmonic generation. So that's um, depending on the percentage of strain, that's the result of uh, an experimental and we did some calculations, which were uh, in good, quite good agreement. And depending on the strain, we can have an emission of second harmonic generation with uh, silicon. And finally, uh, if we go to, to time result spectroscopy, which is very up to date now, uh, it's, it's a way to probe uh, ultra fast transitions in solids. For, I'll just give you two examples. This one is the ultra-fast demagnetization in chromium oxide. So the, the, it's, a, it's usually on, based on bone probe experiment where the material is excited by a strong pulse and a probe comes to probe the change in the material. So it's a short pulse. And by changing the delay between the pump and the probe, you can see uh, the, 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 the way the, the system is evolving into, into time. So this one was uh, the demagnetization in chromium oxide. So you see that we have a strong demagnetization and then it goes back to uh, the, the ground state. Uh, the order is picosecond. And this, this one was an ultra fast reversal in uh, the ferroelectric uh, polarization. So that's the same idea of the system and then you follow in time with second harmonic which is uh, quite sensitive to the, the, the what happens into the material as a function of, uh, of time of course this means that we have short pulses if we want to follow uh, processes that are in the picosecond or femtosecond uh, region femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds so that's quite short So let's go now to third <laughs> nonlinearities. So that's that. That will be quite short. It's the same idea. So we have second harmonic. So we can have third harmonic. We have uh, some frequencies. So we have two, the three frequencies that uh, we can add. So we have a lot of processes that can uh, that can occur. And so. Uh, the simplest one is third harmonic generation. You absorb the three photons, and the emitted frequency is three times the incoming one. Uh, this one is a bit, uh, bit different. It's in a third order process. So you, as I said, you can absorb three photons, but you can also have emission. So you can absorb one photon, emit the same, or absorb the same. That's a three photon process, and then you, so it's, a, it's the same frequency as the incoming light, because one plus one minus one plus one, that gives you as the same as linear optic where you have a function of a process. So it will enter the expression of the refraction index of the material. But now it's a uh, intensity dependent term and uh, it's called the optical care effect. So the, the refraction uh, index is the one you get normally just by linear optics. And you have this additional term, which depends on the chi 3 in that case, and is proportional to the intensity of the field, so the square of the field. 
And it's, uh, so there is no change in the frequency, but it is very important because this term acts as a positive lens. It means that it's a self-focusing term and uh, people doing experiments with ve uh, very intense laser field are always very careful to this term because uh, you have an intense light at the beginning. If at some point there is a self-focusing uh, process that occur in a lens, for instance, suddenly the intensity of the, the, the field is rising and this can be uh, very important and you just break all your optical devices. So this is uh, very fun. This is not uh, wanted. I mean, people try to avoid this self-focusing term, but people have to be aware that uh, it can be very important. So it's a guide three. So I will not go to uh, four. We will count, uh, count as one, two, three a lot <laughs> directly. And then we have high harmonic generation. So at the beginning, it was the experiment was done on a gas jet, so uh, noble uh, rare gases. The the principle is uh, the the principle is very simple. You have an atomic jet, an intense laser. In that case, it has to be quite intense, not really intense. And as a uh, output, you have all kind of frequencies that are emitted. If it's an atomic gas jet, in principle, it's a central symmetric material, so all the, the, the even orders are not present. So we have uh, one, three, five. Uh, it was measured above 400 uh, uh, harmony. And what we get as a nice spectrum is this one. So it's all, all the lines here. It's uh, in terms of the wave of the wavelengths. That's why they are not. Uh, equally spaced. It's equally spaced if you look in frequencies, not equally spaced if you look, look in wavelengths. Uh, you have this, all these lines corresponds to emitted frequency. And uh, the, the amplitude of the emission has a very typical shape. It's this one where for low harmonics, you have a, a, a strong decrease at the beginning. Then you have a plateau where all the harmonics are emitted with more or less the same frequency. And then you have a cutoff, and that's the end of the spectrum. And uh, the, the position of the cutoff depends on the intensity and on the uh, frequency of the input field. So this became... <laughs> so it, it, it's... Now you all know what is what we can do with high harmonic generation um, due to the uh, to the, the Nobel the last uh, Nobel Prize in so in 2023 by uh, Pierre Agostini, Ferenc Gross, and uh, Anne Luyer, where they obtained uh, the emission of uh, attosecond pulses uh, with this high harmonic generation. So at the the first. A pulse that was measured, well, not measured, but deduced from the measurement was 250 attoseconds. So just to be clear, an attosecond is 10 to the minus 18 seconds. So it's it's really the, the time scale of electronic processes uh, in, in matter. And so this was the the emission, the, the, the spectrum that was in time that was uh, get from the experiment that led to the Nobel Prize. I have a question concerning the previous slide. Uh, why is the probability that frequencies within the plateau are, why is the probability that a photon can excite, say a state that is higher, the, the same than uh, previous states? Why, why do well, we have that? In, in fact, uh, you, you really, you, you have to not to think in, in terms of the, the, the schematic view I showed you for the second harmonic where you have two photons that are absorbed, one is emitted. This, this is valid, well, not valid, but it, it, it's, well, it explains well the beginning of the spectrum where we have these three photons absorbed, one is emitted five. 
uh, then it's it's something different that that occurs. Uh, you, you have the, the, the light, so you, there is an oscillating electric field. The, the electrons are moving with the field because uh, it's just the classical force. You submit a charge to an oscillating force, and charge is becoming, starts to oscillate. And because the intensity of the light is quite high, the, the electronic motion, the, the electrons go very far. But when the, the field is changing sign, the electrons are coming back. And when they're, they're close to the, the, the parent ion, they, rec they can recombine. And this creates the plateau. And in the, the probability of having this, uh, the, the emission does not depend that much on the, the, the energy of the, the emitted photon. But they are going, it's what is called the three step model. Uh, an electron is leaving, is escaping the atom by uh, tunneling, goes away, comes back, recombine, and this gives rise to the to the plateau. And the cutoff, in fact, the the, uh, the excursion of the electron uh, depends on the on the intensity of the field, and so after some time, they they cannot go further because they're coming back. That's the maximum excursion they have. And the energies that correspond to this longer excursion cannot be reached. And so that's the sharp the, the cutoff, which is quite sharp. So that's why there is this. Uh, it, it's it's really the, the nonlinear process in a sense that you cannot anymore expand the response in terms of electric field. It's, it's, the series is not converging. So you cannot see we have the second order process, the third and so on. Okay. So now that you know uh, almost everything on what we can do with nonlinear optics, how we can do it from the theoretical point of view. So there are there are several methods to, to describe uh, non the nonlinear response. So we have uh, the perturbative expansion and non-perturbative expansion. So the difference between the two are, in one case, we have the perturbation theory and we take one term, the second order or the third order. In the non-perturbative expansion, you start directly with the full response. You do not expand it. Uh, so this one is uh, mainly based on explicit time propagation, and now Joe will tell you more about that after the after the break. Uh, and I will just show you some example of perturbation, uh, perturbative expansion. Uh, we can do, we can use TDDFT. There are some finite different methods. One is uh, implemented into the Alnit code. Uh, the Sternheimer equation can also be used to get a nonlinear response. And uh, there are some calculations using the Peter salpeter equation that you will see, I think, on, on Friday, uh, that has been extended to uh, second order processes. When you uh, say Sternheimer equations, you mean it's the function of perturbation here? Uh, no, no, not necessarily. No, it's just, it's a. It's a uh, it's a way to get to, to expand in terms of orbitals to certain order, and then you get the response to higher order. For instance, if you expand to uh, order n, you get the response to order 2n plus 1. So it has been used uh, a lot for the static uh, response, but there are some, some uh, cases where it has been extended to frequency depending. So what I will uh, show you here is uh, the second order time dependent density functional theory uh, approach. So this uh, you probably know already. So the, the, the macroscopic polarization of the medium uh, is uh, for this, you need the displacement vector, which contains uh, the total field and this quantity, which is the macroscopic uh, geometric tensor of the medium. And this 
um, tensor can, well, this dielectric uh, response uh, is obtained in terms of the chi one, the first order uh, response function that you probably already calculated yesterday, maybe. What is that? Yeah. So with dp, that's what you you get. So it's the same idea for the second uh, second order response. Uh, then uh, the displacement vector uh, contains an additional term, which is the second order macroscopic uh, polarization. And this second order polarization is described by a chi 2 and uh, the square of the total field. So the idea is to calculate this chi 2 which depends on omega 1 and omega 2. Uh, there, there, is, there are we, we have some strange notations in with the chi 2 and uh, don't be puzzled by this minus. It's just a way to write the chi 2. So when you have a, a plus, it's the absorption of a photon. And when you have the minus, it's the emission of a photon. So in this chi 2, we have the two incoming field, omega 1, omega 2, that are absorbed. And here it's minus omega one minus omega two. So it means that we have a process in which we have the emission of omega one plus omega two. It's a, a bit puzzling at the beginning, but it helps to, to, to see which type of process we are looking at. So what is the, the, the response function? The linear case, it is the functional derivative of the density in TDDFT. Uh, with respect to the external potential. And uh, the dielectric response is obtained in terms of this guy, which for convenience is called rho rho. So it's a density density response. So we look at the variation of the density with respect to a potential. That's, so it's a density density response function. And for second order, we have a density, density, density response function. And so it's the second derivative of the density with respect to the two external potential. You're still with me? And once we have obtained this uh, second order density response function, we have the macroscopic uh, response function. That's the equivalent of this quantity, but to second order. And in that case, you see that it depends also on linear terms. So this one is only the second order, so the second order response. And it is multiplied by three dielectric uh, response, yeah. one at the two incoming frequency and one at the outgoing uh, frequency. So that's what we have to calculate at the at the end. Uh, same as yesterday, we have the independent particle response function, what is the Kunsham response function, and we have a Dyson equation to solve to get the full response function, so the chi one. Chi zero one for the Kunsham response function. <laughs> it depends, the equation depends on the Coulomb potential and on an exchange correlation potential uh, kernel that has to be uh, approximated. Uh, back to basics. <laughs> uh, so this is the, the new Dyson equation. So we have the chi 2 the chi with chi 0 2 which is the, the, the Gunsham response function. You see that this term is very similar to the linear case, except that it is squares now because we have two interaction. Um, so the FXC, which is here, and we have this additional term GXC. And GXC is the second derivative, functional derivative of VXC, the exchange correction uh, potential from GFT with respect to two densities. For this term, we have no approximation. That there is no, 
So for, for the moment, in all the calculations that are done uh, in this framework, this uh, kernel is set equal to zero. We have in mind that it's a small correction. Uh, for some calculations, it, it's clear that it, it is very small because it, it corresponds quite nicely with the experimental results. It might be non-zero for many cases, but uh, there is, for the moment, there is no, no approximation that are available for this term. So once you ignore these parts and consider FXC to be substituted by RPA, so basically we have the response of the system to the first... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in first order, we have the response of the system with respect to Coulomb, and the second one is the response of uh, the, the third order to Coulomb again. Yes. You mean, uh, here, the uh, you, you have exactly the same like the the yeah. The yeah. yeah, you have, uh, if you set, Okay, so we, we suppress this term. Yeah. We don't know what we can do with it. So if we suppress the FXC here and here, it's uh, the RPA result, the same level of approximation. That's correct. And then you, you can include uh, an FXC that is the best uh, suited to the time. So that's exactly the same way of going into the, the level of uh, approximation. Okay, I understand. In first order, the kernel is RPA and uh, is a, a Coulomb V. Yes. And this in for second order, what's the kernel? I couldn't actually realize. Well, you, you have this, and this one is the same as the linear case. It, it appears exactly in the same way. The same kernel? It's the same kernel. It's the, the, the same kernel here. Yeah. So, okay. of course, the, the, the validity of uh, a kernel can depend on the order of the approximation. I mean, if you have a very good approximation uh, for the linear case, you can expect that it's good for the second order case. There is no, no proof because it's not the same process. So the an approximation is always valid in a certain framework. Uh, so you, you have to check. Uh, and so here it's it's a it's a bit difficult to check whether it's good or not because there are not so many uh, experimental results in terms of spectra. Yeah. We have some. A static response for a lot of materials, but to get a, a full spectrum in terms of frequency, uh, we don't have so many. So it's uh, I will show you results, but it's difficult to to really carefully check with the experimental results. And uh, to compare with other calculations, which do not depend on the kernel, that's the idea to to check whether the kernel we use is good or not. <clears throat> the only way is. Uh, uh, to rely on beta side beta calculation in which you do not have to, to, to guess any kernel. And uh, beta side beta to second order has been done, and but it's, it's quite heavy. It's quite Are heavy. you going to show the side beta uh, notation for this second part? I mean, second order response or not? Uh, some results? No, no, for beta side beta. Uh, form of this equation. Now it looks like... Uh, I think Claudio will show you something. Do, do you show something with the belt cell Peter? Yeah, yeah. show with cell Peter, but I won't, I don't, I, I don't think I will go to second time to go to second order. Yeah, okay. Maybe. My question is that once we are going to consider the first order, we have zeta and this kernel and, uh, okay, somehow uh, in terms of self energy, it includes uh, vertex and blah. What is the second uh, order uh, kernel? How it includes? Well, it it will. In fact, well, it depends what what. How, how, how can I say the uh, no no the uh, with with the basis of it, we have second order, but in terms of the perturbation. Yeah. 
when you take the, the difference between the TDDFT or the beta cell beta is the treatment of the, the electronic correlation. So the, the kind of uh, process that you put in the beta cell beta for the linear optic or the, the second order process, optical process, will be the same. You, you do not change the way you treat the electronic uh, correlations by doing a linear, a linear optical calculation or nonlinear optical calculation. This is only on the order of the external perturbation, the electric field. And all the, the diagram that you include or not in the calculation, uh, uh, they, they, they are still, well, if you, if you have a beta cell beta calculation or not, it will be the same. The change is just on the way you, tra you treat the external field, uh, the light. Um, but can you convince uh, other about the intensity approximation for the uh, GXC? So GXC, we uh, we know. So for instance, uh, at the there is a, a kernel that value. value the long range, yeah, the long range the, kernel. The last kernel that you shown. So, the, the the shape of the of this kernel is a coefficient divided by q square. Uh, you you can if you plug a, a shape like this, a form like this for the curve for for the GXC, <laughs> just by considering that it has to be non-divergent when q goes to zero and things like that, uh, the structure has to be some beta parameter divided by q to the power three. This is obvious, but uh, there is no way to decide what is this beta, beta parameter. The only way would be to compare to a beta sub beta calculation uh, or to uh, experimental results. And when we compare to experimental results, there is another approximation that is made in all, all the calculation is the static approximation. All the, kern, the, the kernels do, do not depend on the frequency. And it's difficult to approximate uh, the, the beta, knowing that uh, there is another approximation that is hidden in that. And so the values that we could get for, for beta by comparing with the experimental result might be completely meaningless because we don't know what is more important, the static approximation that we do, or uh, the fact that we neglect the GXC. So for the moment, it's um, that's all. <laughs> that's the end of the story for the for the GXC. But in uh, ADA, you get a constant, right? So still, uh, uh... But, well, the, 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 the shape of this kernel, yes, the, the coefficient is supposed to be constant. Yeah, we we made some we made some tests. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the <laughs> did not work. I mean, we <laughs> we. Okay. We we use because it was quite easy to implement it and to say okay we decide the beta but let's put one let's put uh, ten let's put one point one and, and uh, we did not even know the the sign so it can be one it can be minus one so we we made all these tests and we never found uh, a good result well something that was uh, improving an, uh, the agreement with. Uh, with other theoretical calculation or experimental results. So for the moment, we, we try to improve the, the, the FXC first, and then we will, we will see later. Within the context of uh, heaven pentagon, uh, I, I guess this uh, meaning of vertex is quite similar to this variation of exchange correlation with respect to density. The vertex is basically the variation of self-energy with respect to GRI. Right? Yes. So, uh, have you think on this, uh, that uh, this uh, 
within well, the it, European wide fact, we, we use a little bit of this because uh, we need uh, some corrections for our energies. But the DFT uh, energies are not correct. And in starting with the gap, that is not. Uh, so uh, the, the expressions we have are taking into account the fact that we correct the energies. What we do in practice is we are not doing a full GW calculation, uh, on top of which we could build uh, the, the Puncham response function, but we use the scissor approximation. That's uh, uh, that's what we that's what we do. It it's it's to, from all the calculations I did, it's a, it's a good approximation. As long as you do not go too high in uh, in in terms of the bands, because then the the, the scissor is a rigid shift of the conduction bands. Uh, but in in the optical range, uh, it's not bad. So, but we 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 can also do the full GW calculation and correct all the energies. That's also a possibility. There, there were some calculations that have been done. Uh, for for gallium arsenide, the difference was not uh, was very small. In fact, the scissor approximation was enough. So, how do we do the 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 the, 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 the initial calculation? So we start uh, from from the ground state which is what we do is uh, with the uh, abinet. And we have so at this point to decide with which VXC we are using. Then we have to evaluate the independent particle susceptibility, the one which is based on Kohn-Sham orbitals. Then we solve the Dyson equation. And here, choice of the kernel, FXC, GXC equals zero. And then, uh, from once we have the susceptibility, we define the we calculate the macroscopic susceptibility, and this is done in the code to light that you can you will use uh, this afternoon. So, what is a second order response in real life? Uh, so this is the uh, the independent particle approximation. So the chi zero two. So it looks very complicated, but just to, to, to explain a little bit. Uh, so we have a uh, sum of the bands. So we have three bands because there is the first one, absorption of one photon, absorption of the second photon, and back to the first band. So that there is a sum of uh, three bands and a sum of the K points. We, we have uh, for all, th there are several terms, but we have uh, three matrix elements at the numerator, the one which goes from the, the, the initial the, the balance band to another band and three three terms, and the final one goes back to uh, the initial band. And we have uh, two energy denominators, which depends on here, energy difference of the material, frequency of the, la the laser, and here, another one, and this time it's two omega. So incoming frequency, outgoing uh, frequency. So it is in this way that we can have uh, an important change uh, in terms of frequency, because if we have a resonance here, it means that we have two bands that which energy corresponds exactly to the, the, the incoming frequency. You will see a peak. <laughs> You can have also the case where it corresponds to twice the, the, the frequency. So that will give you also uh, a peak in, in the spectrum. And you can have double resonance. It means that uh, some bands are resonant with this term, and some bands are resonant with this one. So we, you have a double resonance uh, process. As soon as you have a double resonant process, you can have interference between them and it does it's not always constructive interference you can have destructive interference between 
between terms. It's quite difficult to, to decide in advance that uh, it will be high or low uh, for, the, for the result. So we do not use uh, exactly this uh, expression. Uh, we are in the optical range. So this Q that you see in the, I don't know if you can read it here, it's, it's a bit small, but here you have Q1 and Q2, that's the, the, the momentum of the photon. In the optical range, Q is very small. So uh, in fact, this term is almost equal to one. So it's one plus Q something. The one is uh, gives a, a zero contribution. So it means that uh, you, we, if we use this expression, you will need an extremely precise calculation so that all the first order term in terms of Q will cancel, which is what they should do. But numerically, it can be very difficult. So what we did is to take this expression and do analytically the limit Q goes to zero. So that we do not rely on numerical uh, cancellation of terms, uh, which can work or not. So finally, we have this, uh, where you see that we, we do not have any more the exponential, but just the first term of the expansion in terms of Q. So that's this expression that we take, uh, the, the dipole approximation of the chi two from for uh, numerical uh, convenience. Of course, if you can be uh, accurate enough in the calculation, you should recover the same result in, in both calculations. But then in that, when you do the dipole approximation analytically, you, you have a number of terms which is huge. So uh, this is the two first terms. OK, so some example now. So uh, I told you that there are some approximations. So the first approximation that uh, we have is the scissor approximation, because uh, we want a, a good, it is important to get uh, accurate result, to have a, a, a good value for the gap. This is very, this is very important. And uh, this, is, this is a, compar a comparison of the linear, the effect of the scissor approximation, uh, uh, not the scissor approximation, of including a scissor correction for the linear case and for the second harmonic. In the, the linear case uh, for silicon carbide, what you see is that you have a, a really a rigid shift of the spectrum. The, the green one is uh, the calculation without scissor. And the red one is including a scissor. So you, in fact, the, the, the spectrum is just shifted by the, the value of the scissor. It's a, it's a bit more complicated for second harmonic because you, you, in the energy denominator, you, you have terms that contain omega and some other contains two omega. So some peaks of some terms are shifted by the scissor and some others are shifted by half of the scissor. And so, uh, in, in fact, the, the main effect is a mixture between the scissor and half of the scissor. So it's not anymore a, a register shift, and the, 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 the use of the scissor can change uh, the shape of the spectrum, which was not really the case for the linear, uh, the, the linear spectrum. Then this is... Uh, now, an example for gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide uh, is uh, very convenient because we have very, very good experimental results. So that's really helpful when you are testing the coat. That's one of the first calculations we did. So this is the uh, independent particle with the scissor for gallium arsenide uh, compared to uh, the experimental results, that's the, the, the dots. It's, it, it's not awful, but it's not good. The, we, we more or less have the, the, the peak at the good position. The amplitude of the peak is, uh, can be, uh, we can do better. So now the next step is uh, to do an RPA calculation. Yeah. So we include, yeah. we solve the Dyson equation without kernel, just with the effect of the Coulomb potential.
And that's the blue curve. Bad luck, we're decreasing. It, it's very disappointing because it's uh, solving the Dyson equation to second order is, is quite tough. Uh, especially calculating all the terms, it's long, it's becoming very long in terms of computer time. And then you, that, you see that when you include this term, you're going in the wrong direction, it's very disappointing. But well, that's life. So now we, so, uh, now we will include uh, a kernel. And uh, to, to describe the exciton, and so we used uh, what was uh, working very well for the linear case, which is especially for gallium arsenide, uh, which is the long range uh, static kernel. So this alpha constant divided by Q squared. And you see that there is a huge uh, improvement in, in the result. So the, the influence of uh, the exciton, the, of the exciton is uh, for gallium arsenide in the second order case, I don't want to be more general than that, uh, is very, very important. So we really have the, uh, the amplitude of the peak, which is, uh, uh, which is good. How can we improve this agreement? Because it's not perfect. We suspect that here, uh, we, we have a, an effect of the adiabatic kernel. It, it could be it, it could be the the way to to cure this discrepancy here. In this region, uh, it could be GXC, but we do not have any any way for the moment to check whether it is a GXC or not. Uh, we, I will show you some some calculation on silicon surface. And in that case, uh, it's uh, the hydrogen hydrogenated surface. And uh, what, what we usually say from surface is that the local fields are important, or should be important, because local fields are a way to see the inhomogeneity of the materials. They reflect the inhomogeneity of the material. And when you have a surface, it's clear that you have a strong way. A strong inhomogeneity. So we expect the local field to be to be important, and it, it depends on the direction of the field. In fact, there are some cases where there are very strong local fields, and in some cases, no. <laughs> so, if you look at this this situation, there is a. I don't remember which one, which is which. The the yeah the 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 red line is without local field, so uh, or, uh, IPA, independent particle approximation. And this one, we include the local field. And it is the case where the incoming field are perpendicular to the surface, and the polarization is detected also perpendicular to the surface, which means that we really see really the surface of the material, the below and, uh, and above. And in that case, we, we have the feeling that there is a shift in, in the peak. It's not a shift. It's just a mixture of different contribution that change in amplitude. And uh, in the, here we have uh, constructive interferences in the IPA case at low energy and destructive interferences at higher energy. And when we increase, when we in, include the local field, it's the, the, the other way. And it's, there is no shift in the, in the spectrum. Just some parts that was are going up and mm -hmm. up and down. Now, if everything is par, yeah, if the two incoming fields uh, are parallel to the to the surface and the polarization is perpendicular, you see that in that case it's uh, it's not so strong. And if everything is parallel, all the fields are parallel to the surface. There is almost no effect of the of the local field, which. Okay, and so the the last example. So e fish, it's not it's not a fish. It's just electric field induced uh, second harmonic. So it's the the the, the second process, second order process plus a static field. So it's like the electro-optic effect, the Pockel's uh, effect, but to second order. Uh, 
so it, it corresponds to a process in which the two photon from the incoming field are uh, absorbed and a, a photon of energy zero is, uh, is absorbed. So the out, it's a chi three. And the, but the outgoing photon is the same as the one you get from a second harmonic generation. And uh, we did this calculation because we were in collaboration with some, uh, some experimental uh, people. And uh, they were suspecting that in, in their second harmonic signal, what they get was an efficient process. And it's extremely difficult to disentangle second harmonic from efficient. Because if you look at uh, the response in terms of frequency, it's a two omega emitted photon. If you look at the, the, the dependence in terms of the intensity of the external field, it's the square of the intensity. So it's really a, a mixture of the, of the two process and you cannot say which is which. So we decided to, uh, to do the calculation. I'm not sure at that time that it was a good idea. So same business. So we write the guy three. We put one of the frequency equal to zero. So it means that we have divergences everywhere. So we have to remove the divergence because there are just fake divergence. And one term is diverging, but another one is diverging also and they, they, they cancel. So we have to know which is canceled with the, with the other. And then the dipole approximation. And so we get something like this. And this is not the end. We have this also. <laughs> and uh, OK, so finally, we, we, we coded uh, these expressions without local fields, I have to admit. <laughs> we haven't been <laughs> long gone so far. And uh, this is uh, the result of a, a calculation. And what is funny in this calculation is that it is a comparison with silicon and silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is a non-central symmetric material. So the chi-2 is non-zero. Uh, the chi-3 for e fish is very small. If you take silicon, silicon is a central symmetric material. So the chi-2 is zero. So in that case, it's clear. If you get a signal, it comes from the e fish. But the, the final result is that for silicon, the chi-3 is huge. And so I don't know whether it's a general result when you have a chi-2, which is equal to zero for centris, central symmetry reason, whether the chi-3 becomes very large. I don't know because I do not have enough experience. But uh, from an experimental point of view and from the idea that we can use silicon to or photonics, for instance, this is uh, this is quite important. And just thank you for your attention. Can you get a single formulation for an uh, optical check? It's difficult to invent an optical <laughs> modification of the this. Mm -hmm. You can get. Uh, uh, it's possible, but you really have to work on, on the expression because when you get the, just uh, uh, again for the optical frequency, optical rectification, the fact that the, the final frequency is zero will uh, induce a lot of divergence in the in, in the response that you and you have to remove them. It's it's very difficult to take the uh, the, the the result for finite frequency. And, and go slowly to very low frequency and <clears throat> hope that you will get a final result. You, you see that at the beginning, it, you, you go to low frequency and suddenly it's divergent. So you, you really have to do the job analytically before, otherwise uh, get in trouble. But once you have done this, uh, this analytical uh, limit, uh, you have optical, optical illusion. Yes. I was just curious, how is the convergence of chi to uh, zero with the number of bands that you include? Uh, it's, it's not too bad. 
you you have to increase you have to increase more than in fact usually we do first the, the linear calculation we see how many bands we need and then of course we have to increase because uh, you you at the given incoming frequencies uh, you absorb two photons so you need more bands because you you go higher in the, in the energy mm -hmm. but uh, it is not really problematic. It, yeah, it just in, compared to the linear case, you increase a little bit, and uh, and it, it's not too bad. It, it's more dif it's difficult. It's more difficult to converge in terms of uh, of k points. But k points are important. Yes. Thank you. How many uh, so you showed the experimental data for the cat with the So uh, so how how many uh, experimental data are there for this? Uh... Well, there is this spectrum, which is uh, well, not not really new. I think it, it is, if I remember correctly, it's uh, two thousand three or two thousand one, right? Beginning of two thousand. Uh, for the moment, it's it's more or less the best. Uh, there are some. Uh, there are not so many. There are a lot of materials for which we know uh, the static coefficient, so omega equals zero, and some points because they they use they, they have a laser and they get the coefficient. So it's not always very easy to with three points on a curve to. <laughs> but it's a fair except for that of that other. Um... It's difficult to mesh because they start destroying the material. But, uh... No, turn, turn harmonic. Uh, no, it's okay. Uh, in fact, I, I was told once by, by somebody who was doing experiment that when they when they want to to have the third harmonic, they do it in two steps. They first uh, create the second harmonic, and then recombine the second harmonic with the Incoming, so that get they get three because uh, very often the third order process is less efficient than two second order process on top of each other. That's what I was told. <laughs> I'm wondering about the um, Parkles um, effect within the long wavelength approximation because they're basically these two. Um, field where you're exciting the material, one is optical and light, and the other one would be the static field, which has very low frequency or mm -hmm. basically no frequency. Is the dipole approximation actually? We're sort of like a field that we're reaching the limit of the model where uh, we don't in, necessarily have an oscillating in, excitation anymore, but just yeah, a in rigid shift. In fact, uh, the, the way we did it is we, we took the chi 2 with two different frequencies, omega 1, omega 2, and uh, we, we one of the frequency goes to zero. But the, at the beginning, the, the expression that we have is the one which is not in the dipole approximation. <coughs> and when you do the limit, q goes to zero, and one of the frequency goes to zero, you have to be extremely careful in the way you do the limit. Uh, so usually what we do is uh, we first have the dipole approximation. So that's done. We don't, do not have Q anymore. And then one of the frequency goes to zero. If you do it the other way, you are in trouble. Because some terms are, are diverging. You, you really There is really a way to do it, which is... Um, uh, you, you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. But then we, 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 everything is in the dipole approximation. So the, the field is static, mm -hmm. but is also uh, does not depend on space. Mm -hmm. That's the case for the two fields. Mm -hmm. I'm not extremely familiar with the formalism of the dipole approximation. Um, at least not anymore. Um, but Q goes to zero means dipole approximation yes and this would be um but if q goes to zero then we don't have an oscillation in in space space yeah which we have only the the oscillation in time 
which is what we want. Okay. But, but we don't have uh, an oscillation in space. It mean, in fact, it means that uh, the oscillation in, in, in space uh, is much larger than the unit cell, mm -hmm. which is in the optical frequency, which is the case. Okay. And the opposite, being away from the dipole approximation, would be using um, pulsed lasers or? Uh, X-ray, XUV or X-ray. Uh, but th there are now experiments that are going in this direction. <laughs> so so the, the, the limit of the dipole approximation is not uh, clearly really known. It seems that for, for many, what has been seen in many calculations, is the fact that the dipole approximation is usually valid, uh, much more valid than what we could expect. Uh, because there, there, there were some calculations, especially for, for in the case of atoms, where the two calculations were done with the, the dipole approximation and without. And uh, you can go quite, in that case, you could go quite high in frequency uh, to, to be still valid in the, to be the, in the dipole approximation. But then you have also to be careful uh, if you, when you do, when you go away from the dipole approximation, <laughs> is the fact that the order of the corrections can be of the same order of some relativistic corrections. And doing one without doing the other is, a, is problematic. And that could be a reason why the dipole approximation sometimes is valid in a very long range, just because uh, they compensate the, 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 uh, with the, the relativistic correction. There, there's a case where we have seen that for atoms. Mm -hmm. the, di the dipole non-relativistic calculation was very good compared to experiments. Mm -hmm. Only the, the keeping the non-dipole terms was wrong. If only the relativistic correction was wrong, and putting the two together, they cancel, and you were going back to the, to the dipole non-relativistic dipole approximation. But the, the the order of the correction is more or less the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, be careful. <laughs>